Martin Hugh is a former officer in the British Parachute Regiment. He was critically wounded in Afghanistan during a shootout with the Taliban, resulting in his arm becoming permanently paralysed. After this, he turned his mind to extreme expeditions, being one of very few people to walk to the North Pole and climb Mount Everest with the use of only one arm. He's also represented Team GB in the Paralympics. During this episode, we get a deep and detailed insight as to what it is like to face Taliban machine gun fire head on, the mentality required to overcome something like this, and what it really takes to climb Mount Everest with the use of just one arm. Keep it locked. My name is Nick Nagarko and you are locked into Culture TV. For the culture, by the culture. Let's go. Martin Hewitt, thank you very much for coming down today, mate. You're welcome. What a story. Where do we even begin with this? Where? So, to clarify for the, the viewers watching this, so you are a former captain in the British Parachute Regiment turned explorer, motivated by, it's not a fatal injury because you stood here, but I mean, um, a pretty severe wo uh, injury um, in Afghanistan. Yeah. Would that be a good summary in 10 seconds? <laughs> Just a blog, basically. Yeah. A blog that goes on a few walks. So, um, <clears throat> so you've, you've, you've got a show out currently on Amazon Prime. Uh, what's, what's that show called? Adaptive Everest. Adaptive Everest. And that was yourself and two other, one, one other injured sol ex injured soldier. Yeah, and then... another injured paratrooper, a mate of mine called Terry, who's got an amputated leg below yeah. the knee. He lost his leg to a IED blast in Afghanistan. Right. And then uh, a lady on our team called Sam Burns. She's a uh, physiotherapist. She's mm -hmm. not an ex military. Mm -hmm. And she had an accident on her when she was tobogganing uh, right, okay. in St. Anton. And she fell off the side of a mountain and uh, went into a coma. And a brain injury and a paralyzed right arm. Wow. Um, so Sam trekked to base camp with us. Yeah. And me and Ever me and Terry were on the summit team. Did you know Terry back in Afghanistan? No, we were. So the parachute twenty regiment's got three battalions, yeah. and we were in different battalions. Mm -hmm. So whilst you know of people, yeah. we didn't directly serve with each other. Um, we only met each other post injury. So when did you <clears throat> when did you first go to Afghanistan? Um, first tour there was in two thousand and six with three para. Right. Uh, in the summer. That, that, that summer. And what was the training like before you, you, so when you joined the army, when did you join the army actually? Well, I, I went down the officer route in the army. Yeah. So there's two different routes. You can go as a, as a soldier mm -hmm. uh, as, and you enter as a, as a private initially, right. or you can go in as an officer where you enter as an officer cadet. Yeah. Um, the route I took was the officer route. Mm -hmm. So all officers go to Sandhurst for a year, yeah. which is a, a military training establishment mm -hmm. in, in Surrey. And there you'll spend a year learning about leadership, and right. uh, learn the basics of soldiering, mm -hmm. and basically preparing you to take on the responsibility of a, of a commission in the and, army. And what year was that that you did that? was that? 2004, so I spent so, a year there. So you <clears throat> you joined the army, what I'm sort of getting at is you kind of joined the army knowing the country was fighting abroad in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. So you knew that by becoming an officer in, <clears throat> in the parachute regiment, there's a 99% chance you're going to be going to one of these places. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I was at university when 9-11 happened. Right. And I was in the reserves at the time. Um, oh, okay. And I remember speaking to several other guys that were in the unit with me. Mm -hmm. um, and we were saying, this is going to change everything. Yeah. You know, and we were, I mean, I was always intending to join the military anyway. I'd wanted to do that for a long time. Yeah. Um, what made you want to join the military? I think, well, a number of different things. I, I, I enjoyed, I did some stuff with the cadets and the reserves and mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. Um, I looked at different roles and responsibilities in different jobs. I looked at the police, looked at GCHQ. Yeah. I looked at business. I did a business degree. So mm -hmm. I did, I did a, a year in industry to see what that as a career would, would be like mm -hmm. in, in marketing. Yeah. Um, and of everything that I did from probably the age of 14 through to 21, 22. Yeah. It was the 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 activity and and the challenge that I faced doing the things with the reserves that I enjoyed and thrived off more than anything else. Right. And so I thought, well, you know, we're fortunate to live in a country where you've got the opportunity to kind of invest in, you know, following your path and following yeah. your dream. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I want to do that. Mm -hmm. So I chose to do that because I thought I'd enjoy it more than anything else. Yeah. So you went to Sandhurst. You did one year's training there. And then, so what happened then? Where did you, where was your first tour? 
Well, so after Sandhurst, you carry on training. <clears throat> so the army, okay. the army invests quite heavily in, in people development prior to expecting you to do the job for real. Okay. So you do a, as an officer, you'll do a year at Sandhurst, and then all the infantry officers they went to a place called Brecon mm -hmm. in South Wales. Um, we went to the infantry battle school, and there you'll learn tactics and right. you'll learn how to use different weapon systems. You'll learn how to plan and execute yeah. certain types of operations. Would you go through the same physical training as a private would go through as an officer? Uh, well, I'm not sure because I've went through the private system, um, right. but I would expect that you go through a, a greater level of physical assessment. Oh, really? You, well, you would be. I, I would <clears throat> expect every officer in the army to be of a certain standard of physical fitness, and right. the parachute regiment, you are certainly expected to be of a high standard of physical fitness. Right. Uh, if you're not up there with the top blokes in your unit, then. Yeah. From my perspective, people will be asking questions as to why not. Right, uh, it's a fundamental part yeah. of leadership, in my opinion. Yeah, and so there's there's differences between the basic standard of physical fitness that's expected at entry level. Mm -hmm. The parachute regiment then got a completely different standard. It's it's which is just under its own. So if the entry own level is process, here, would you say parachute regiment is sort of? It's higher. A lot higher. It's higher. Yeah. It's quite, <laughs> if anyone's interested, just go onto YouTube or yeah. just Google. P company, Pegasus company, yeah. which is the selection process for the parachute, the physical aspect of the selection process for the parachute regiment. Right. And people can judge for themselves what's expected. So you you, you did you at Bracken for a bit. <clears throat> yeah, learn tactics. Yeah. And then you <clears throat> go to P, P company, right. which is just for the parachute regiment mm -hmm. um, and airborne forces. They have to go and do a, a separate physical assessment to the rest of the army. Yeah. And that process of uh, all arms P company, which is what officers do, yeah. is a month, uh, it's three weeks worth of, in essence, um, preparation assessments and tests and yeah. exercises and then you have something called test week and that's a series of, of tests physical tests a log race a stretcher race a steeple chase uh, an aerial assault course to yeah. test your ability to control any anxiety you might have at heights yeah. which is kind of fundamental to a power trooper's role yeah, you'd and, think then, so. <laughs> yeah and then different distances with weight so mm -hmm. a 10 mile march a 20 mile march a two mile march all with weight on and you go do them all within set times and you've then got a uh, million which right. is standing toe to toe from an opponent of a similar height and weight mm -hmm. and you've got to strike each other in the face with straight punches so it's not boxing you can't block or rip or hook it's just straight punches to demonstrate that you've got the ability to have the ability to demonstrate controlled aggression on and off so wait so you basically got to stand there still and someone punches you in the face well you've got to punch them ideally as well mm -hmm. but you're both trying to punch each other here for a minute so is it like a trade like you go first i go and then you both it, go with everything mm -hmm. you've got oh, so you, just, oh so you can just you, oh it's just a fight then basically well it's it's a it's it's a it's a it's a display of controlled aggression so you stand toe to toe and you it's not a fight because you can't you can't move you can't you can't you can't shift you can't it's not okay. a boxing match you can't the certain the certain box of punches you can't use so you can't use a hook you can't use a rip you can't you're literally just using a jab and a cross. Right. So you've got to stand blow to blow, direct to the face. Can you block? No. So you've got to take it? Well, it depends how fast you are and how good you are. <laughs> I took a lot when I got hit. <laughs> As you were better than me, probably didn't. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so, the, so you do all that. Yeah. If you pass all of that, mm -hmm. um, you then go to Bryce Norton, our RAF centre. Yeah. And you then do your parachute training school. And right. that's where they're teaching you to jump out of an aircraft with kit on. Wow. How much kit? It ranges, it, it, it varies from, it's a, it, like all these things, it's progression. Yeah. So you start with nothing on and you mm -hmm. learn the drills and skills, uh, emergency procedures if things mm -hmm. go wrong, and then you start introducing kit, you then start doing it at night, which is when the majority of our jumps uh, exercise level, and if we did it tactically for real, you would mm -hmm. be doing the majority of this kind of stuff at night. So it's a progressive uh, process up until that point. So as a fully trained parachuter, in what sort of weight would you be expected to carry jumping out of a plane in the middle of the night? Well, that varies because uh, uh, the the parachute regiment jumped with something called an LLP, a low-level parachute, or it did back in my day, mm. and that has something called an all-up weight. So, when you are being dispatched from an aircraft, the, the the kind of synergy of moving down there is often kind of lost because mm. someone disembarks in the wrong way or the timings yeah. go out. So often you can get paratroopers meeting each other at the back of the aircraft right. as their parachutes are deploying, and that can result in entanglements right. um, because you've also got a lot of people deploying in a short area to mm -hmm. get into a drop zone area yeah you get a lot of paratroopers in the sky at the same time and so they can collide with one another right. and different things can happen you can get something called an earth steel which is when the parachute that's higher than you basically a paratrooper will float above you yeah you they will you will steal their air so their right. parachute will inflate you'll they'll fall down onto you 
collapse your canopy, go beyond, below you, right. and then it'll reinflate again. Unless, and that keeps on happening until one of you hits the floor. Unless one of you can grab the rigging lines and right. one parachute then brings down two paratroopers. You can also get entanglements, you can get air steel. So there's all sorts of things that can happen. Yeah. But all to say, fairly frequently, two paratroopers end up coming together. Yeah. So one parachute has got to bring the weight of two down. Now, you and I are different weights. Mm -hmm. I had soldiers under my command who were you know, 11 stone, 10 mm -hmm. stone. I had soldiers who were 19 stone. Jesus. So, the all up weights is still got to be adhered to. Mm. So a heavier paratrooper will carry less kit. Yeah. Because they've got to meet that all up weight requirement. Right. Okay. So it's all down to you, which means that when you're in the aircraft, yeah. if you're five foot six and weighing 10 and a half stone, yeah. you're going to have a hell of a lot of kit yeah. to try and move down the aircraft with. Right. If you're 18, 19 stone, you're going to be jumping with not a great deal at all. Yeah, the pump bag. <laughs> yeah. So hence this, the, the synergy goes because someone who's five foot five and yeah. 10 stone wet through yeah. is going to struggle to get down that aircraft. Right. Uh, in time. they've basically got to bring the supplies for the others, essentially. Exactly, yeah, yes. Yeah. It's what is the unit. The unit needs to be... Right. Everything in the military is about the team. Right. Yeah, you know, the team needs to be able to operate as a team coherently together. Right. So the team collectively needs that kit. What was your first tour? Where did you first go as a fully trained professional officer? So I commissioned into three Parry. Uh, they were based in Colchester. Mm -hmm. And when I arrived, we... We hadn't been told we were going to Afghanistan at that point, but we knew that we were in the pipeline for it. And it was going to be the first deployment of the British Army in Helmand. Were so you anxious was, about going to Afghanistan? Um, not at all, no. I mean, I was excited. Yeah. Uh, I think people join the military for different reasons. Hmm. You know, I, I joined... You, you don't join the parachute regiment because you're kind of at a loss or you're not sure what to do. Yeah. It's got a robust selection process. And as an officer, it's a very competitive organisation to get into. Okay. You've got to really want it. Yeah. You know, so I... I joined the military specifically to join the parachute regiment. Yeah. I wasn't interested in anything else. Yeah. I only wanted that. Right. And so I wanted that because I wanted to be tested. I wanted to command mm -hmm. on operations. I didn't want to join the army and spend mm -hmm. you know, four years in Germany or Cyprus or two yeah. of my thumbs over here. I yeah. wanted to go and I wanted to go into combat. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, yeah, I wasn't nervous, but uh, apprehensive about it, but we're extremely well prepared and trained. Yeah, so by the time and do you feel that that training and preparation that you experienced at Sandhurst and, and Brecon and translated to, to on the ground when you got there, when you got into Afghanistan? Well, you then go through further training. So right. the training that we then do as a unit is specific to the unit tasks right. um, and to the environment we're going into. Mm -hmm. So all that training beforehand, Sandhurst and Brecon is literally just the base level. Mm -hmm. You then do specialist training after that internally within your own unit. Right. And it was that training that specifically that prepared us for what we were anticipating doing. Yeah. And again, the parachute regiment has its own way of doing that, right. which is fairly unique and slightly <laughs> different to the rest of the army, but it works. Yeah. You know, and it's, it, makes, it made us, in my opinion, fit for purpose. How many tours of, of Afghanistan did you do? I did, well, two full, I was out there three times, but I did two full tours out there. Two full tours. Yeah. Um, what was your first experience of, of <clears throat> Afghanistan like? Um, <sighs> partly chaos. You know, yeah. we, we, we went, because three part when they went in in 2006 was the first major unit to deploy there into Helmand. There were some reconnaissance elements that went out early. Yeah. Um, but so we were was it only 2006 that the, that the British went over there? Into Helmand, yeah, which right. is a, an area in the south of Afghanistan, which is basically the hotbed of, of Taliban al-Qaeda activity at the time. Right. Uh, there were other areas where it was high as well, but that was, in essence, the, the safe space. Right. So we, the British military had, had a special forces commitment there mm -hmm. and a few other specialist units going out into different parts of the country, as did other the NATO, excuse me, and INISA forces. Yeah. But it started to ramp up in 2006. Yeah. Um, and when we first got out there, we our mission in essence was to try and stabilize an area so that we could bring in greater capability and start applying, you know, some support to the local population that had known yeah. nothing but war for a long time. In yeah. order to bring NGOs in and other organizations that could start trying to build infrastructure and support, yeah. we had to provide security first. But we had a very small number of troops in a very large area of ground, surrounded by a lot of people that wanted, didn't want us to be there. So we quickly found ourselves in a position where we were fighting on a regular basis. Can you remember your first contact experience there? Uh, I can actually, yeah. Yeah, our first contact was in a place called Sangin, yeah. uh, which became a forward operating base. But when we first got there, these base infrastructure sites weren't there. It was just, uh, we had a camp called Camp Bastion, which became quite well known yeah, because of all the press around it. But when we first got to Bastion, it was just literally a 
kind of a, a technical landing strip, a, a basic field hospital, a basic cookhouse and, yeah. and some tents. That was it. Yeah. Um, there weren't any forward operating bases. We just landed in kind of areas that were a district center or a, an Afghan national police kind of cell yeah. or even just a compound. And then we'd start building from scratch with sandbags um, wow. and fighting. And uh, yeah, it was a very different, very different tour to what it became. Um, but the nature of the threat was different. In that first tour, we were we were mostly fighting with you know infantry tactics, so weapon, small arms weapon systems, mortars in support, you know bayonets fixed often, mm -hmm. and it was combat rather than fighting a an IT, an, um, a counter IED improvised right. explosive device campaign, which is what often happened. Because and the thing is, you wouldn't changed. you wouldn't be able to. They, there's no uniform. There's no with, with with like the Taliban. They would just be dressed as locals. You wouldn't necessarily. Am, am I right in saying that that you wouldn't necessarily know who was who if someone like if someone was walking down down the street and they might have a, they might have a, a device strapped to them or underneath the clothing you wouldn't necessarily know off appearance that that was um an al -Qaeda, was al qaeda or the taliban or... yeah not at all and the enemy will actively do things to try and confuse you so yeah. often they would dress as women you know right. with face veils on so that you couldn't see them wow. and suddenly appear you know bring a weapon system out from nowhere or or bring them out from a building and start firing. And then they would, because they know our rules of engagement as well. Yeah. We, we always operate, the British Army operates under a level of rules of engagement. And that is, you know, the rules of engagement will change from tour to tour and from where, you know, threat level. Yeah. There's lots of different factors that affect what you can do and when you can use force. And the enemy knew that. Mm. And so they would ditch weapon systems as well, knowing that we wouldn't be able to engage them if they didn't have a, a weapon system on, didn't present right. an immediate threat to loss of life. Uh, and so they would use a lot of different tactics on their part to disguise themselves. And they would frequently use human shields as well, you know, women well, and children, to, be, to try and protect themselves from being shot whilst firing at us. Wow. Yeah, so a lot of underhand tactics, but that gives you an idea of what they're about. So when you first, on that first contact experience, what, what sort of, how did that make you feel? Like, can you? Well, yeah, you, the training kicks in. You, yeah. you, you know, soldiering is a, is a trade. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a profession. So does the training, because I mean, I mean, for me, as someone who's got no experience in, in training for the army whatsoever, yeah. like I can imagine like, it's all very well doing like training, but when someone's there sh firing a machine gun at you, it's a whole like- It's a different ball game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you, you, you can try and replicate the, the environment you go into as much yeah. as you can in training, but you will never, achieve all elements of that, yeah. especially where it's like to get shot at. Yeah. Uh, however, <laughs> um, the process is what's important. Mm. So how do we, you know, from a young officer's perspective, you've got a, a template of how to conduct uh, an attack, basically. Yeah. And then there's a way in which you deliver your plan to your soldiers, and then mm. they have ways in which they do their job to, to achieve the effect that you're trying to achieve. Yeah. That's what's important, and that is what kicks in. Right. Uh, your ability to remain calm under pressure mm -hmm is something that, again, you can train for, mm. and some people are good at, some people less so. Have you seen people who've been through similar training who've completely cracked once the reality of this situation oh, kicks right, in? Yeah. yeah, 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 you do. And you can never really know what somebody's gonna be like under pressure until they're under pressure for real. Because to have your, your actual life be threatened to a point where any second now you could be shot dead between the eyes, like there's no greater fear in a human being that a human being could ever have really to, to know that they could die at any any second now is their life could be gone. And I kind of always struggle to imagine like how you could train. I can imagine training yourself physically for it. I can imagine you can train yourself strategically, what the processes that you would go through, but like the actual emotion and the feeling of that fear of life, I can't, I can't I've always struggled to grasp like how would, you train to remain in complete tact during that situation. I suppose it's it's probably down to the individual, really, isn't it? And well, it's, it's, it's individual. But there are differences in people. However, there's a lot you can do in training to okay. prepare people to remain calm yeah. under pressure in that kind of environment, um, and and ultimately the strength of the dynamic of the team yeah. plays a huge <clears> part as well. I mean, there's been a plethora of studies done in the past around you know what makes high performance team operate under the highest levels of stress you can be under which for me is combat i've never yeah. experienced anything else in the world and i don't think there is another role in any society that puts people under a greater level of risk than, than combat than war you know where you've got an active enemy trying to kill you and yeah. you're trying to do the same to them yeah uh so it's quite a unique environment but 
the esprit de corps and the camaraderie that we have mm. as soldiers, especially in the parachute regiment, goes a long way to ensuring that people psychologically mm. are doing everything that they can within their power to remain calm and to dig out blind for one another. And that is really effective. And did you lose friends over there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's many people who served over there in that time that they didn't, to be honest, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. And that's yeah, you know, that that is a a bit of there's I think the biggest part of challenge of that aspect of the challenge is that you are you operate in an environment where you may lose someone and within the same day you could be fighting with bayonets fixed and then an hour later hosting a, a meeting with locals that you're trying to help and support you know, mm. or dealing with the, the the you know the fallout of, of combat mm. uh, so you've got to be able to you've got to have the professionalism to be able to switch your mindset quickly you know and suppress certain emotions as well you know you can't in my opinion you, know, you couldn't necessarily afford to show or feel too much sorrow and loss at that point yeah. you've got a job to do and you've got a responsibility especially as an officer or as a nco which is a uh, a term for some, a, a, like a non-commissioned officer which mm. the army's got a series of different ranks and different ranks have different levels of responsibility and when you're in a position of responsibility you have to put that in my opinion above anything else yeah so you that isn't the time to start thinking about your personal loss yeah there's been a lot of controversy about whether it was right for the british army to be in afghanistan um and whether it was I don't know the right thing to do in terms of was it America's war that we were fighting, and I'm sure you've read a lot of the same headlines. Um, what what's your sort of stance on on that? Like you, you're someone who's seen what the army's been doing there firsthand. You've took part in it. How would you how how would you describe that? From, well, I think from when your... you're as a junior officer, you're you're there to do your job. You yeah. know, foreign policy is foreign policy. Yeah. And the military is a tool of politics. Yeah. Always has been, always will be. Yeah. We are there to serve the public that yeah. we represent. Um, so you go and do whatever you're asked to go and do. Mm. Um, whether we should have been there or not, frankly, wasn't something that I thought about at the time. Yeah. However, what I can say is that we saw evidence on the ground of people that were planning to execute exercise um, attacks, terrorist attacks yeah. in the UK. Really? Yeah. So there was a direct correlation between mm -hmm. the disruption efforts that we were having yeah. and the threat to this country yeah. at that time. So, and know, support the local people as well. well I mean, so it's, it, there's, there's more. I mean, I've never, I've never been in that role, but I would imagine there are a great deal of you know, factors that people make into it. It's been ravaged by war for so long, that country, hasn't it? It has, yeah. yeah the Russians in, was it the 80s, 70s they went in? Yeah, the, uh, yeah 70s, yeah. They're in there in the 80s, early 80s. Yeah, we've been, obviously, there's a, there's, there's, if anyone's interested in the history of it, there's a great book called The Great Game. Yeah, and I've heard about, I need to read this book. I've heard read. about this book. And I'll give you an insight into the, yeah. the history of, of Afghanistan. <clears throat> And the challenges it, of, of military operations in particular in that country. Yeah, because they say it's the country that can never be fully conquered, isn't it? Well, it's it's a, down it's to a, the terrain or... Yeah, the know. combination of factors, yeah, the terrain, the, the topography of the landscape. Mm. Uh, it's landlocked country and that presents a challenge in itself. Yeah. The heat, uh, yeah. there's a, a resupply out yeah. there, which in this day and age is a lot easier because of advances in technology. But back yeah. in the day, resupplying troops on the ground out there was very difficult indeed. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a very challenging environment to operate in and to and to try and operate as a military force in. So it's during your third tour in two thousand and seven that you were shot. Was that yeah. the first time you'd been shot? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, first time I managed to enjoy the experience of a bullet <laughs> <laughs> or two bullets, in fact. <laughs> so t tell me about that day. So. Because you were, you were shot, where, where exactly were you, were you shot? Well, the f first bullet went into the, an area called the brachial plexus, so just yeah. above my chest in the shoulder area. Yeah. Um, and the second bullet went into my foot. So the second bullet went to the foot. But it was this one that caused the most damage. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah I mean, the foot was just a flesh wound, it was fine. So but that was this, fine. this one, yeah, it, the bullet went in, it kind of it severed the brachial artery, which is the main artery supplying blood flow to your right arm. It severed all of the nerves in my right arm, so the arm became paralyzed instantly. Yeah. Um, I had instantly, called, was it? Yeah, instantly, yeah. So I had, I had something called a femurex, which is a collapsed lung. Yeah. Um, and it shattered the scapula. So the bullet luckily went straight through because had it have deviated at all, it would have killed me. It would have hit the heart. So, so if it deviates, so it came in through, what about here? Yeah, it came in 
there. Right. Let's go. Yeah, so an inch so, the other way, it'd have hit my heart. So an inch this way, you wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, so, and, and what were you shot with? Uh, something called PKM, which is a heavy machine gun. How big are the bullets? It's a 7.62 caliber round. So anyone that's interested in bullets can look at what <laughs> yeah. that is. It's, you know, it's not to, enough to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was lucky, very lucky. You know, I got, yeah, so I got hit on, um, and where, where, so where, where were you when you got hit? What happened sort of? Well, we're in this area called Hellman still. So yeah. we were out there. My job at the time was to train an indigenous Afghan force. So okay. we were out there doing that. And um, and we were going into an area uh, where we knew there was an enemy presence uh, and uh, firefight ensued. And as we were trying to attack at a position, um, a second position opened up that we didn't know was there. And, I, and a, a round of bullets came into me and, uh, and one went through. Um, so I did a backflip. Um, so what were you like hid behind the wall? I was knelt down. Yeah, yeah, I was knelt because I was trying to get a team to move basically. So yeah. I was up trying to move, get people to move. And how long had this firefight been going on before that you well, were we'd shot? Well, we'd been fighting in that area for five days. Right. Kind of probing it from different areas. Yeah. And that day we'd been fighting for probably about an hour and a half, two hours. Right. Um, so we were into the fight. We've been we've been moving into this area for a, a while and getting and closer. So you were gaining ground on, yeah. on, on the enemy he was shooting at, yeah? Yeah. And it was an hour and a half into this particular gunfight that you were kneeling down and then... And then the first round came in. Yeah. Uh, well, round, a, a group of a group of ammunition rounds landed. Yeah. And, um, and, the, and one went through and I kind of did a backflip, landed on my back. Uh, at first I thought I'd lost the arm. I, yeah. thought, I thought the whole thing had gone. So I kind of, kind of looked around and started looking for my arm. Yeah. And then realized that, you know, there was still battle going on. So I had to try and get on the radio to tell another officer to kind of take over basically to get yeah. somebody else to move forward. Um, so you were doing this with, with the bullet after after the, after the, the first impact? Yeah, right. yeah. So you, well, you still got to, you're still trying to get yeah. a job So you done. were conscious then is what I yeah, mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, I was conscious throughout. Yeah, yeah. so, um, and then I'd lost quite a lot of blood quite quickly. Knew it was quite a serious injury because of the speed at which I was losing blood out and it was projecting out. So I knew it was an arterial bleed. Wow. Um, and then I had a couple of guys with me that were basically trying to help me stem the bleeding. Right. Um, so all the people took in over the, battle the battle. Field. Yeah, yeah. So all the people took over the battle, and then the team immediately around me then tried to help me stem the blood flow. We managed to manage to get my finger into the entrance wound, mm -hmm. and with your finger. Yeah, and yeah. the doctors think that putting some form of direct pressure on the arteries because the an artery will often retract if you sever it. Yeah. So it retracts into the body, and then it's very difficult to get hold of. Yeah. So my fear was that that would happen, and I'd bleed out. So I tried to get my hand in to try and get some sort of pressure on. We have uh, a, a medical uh, gauze called the first field dressing. Mm -hmm. So we were getting them out and try and put pressure on the wound to try and reduce the, the blood flow. Yeah. Um, went through six or seven of them. Normally with a lot of kind of bleeds and gunshot wounds or blast injuries, you then tourniquet the area to reduce the blood flow. But because of the position it was in, you, you can't tourniquet this part of the chest. So we have to just try and put as much direct pressure on it as we could to try and install the blood flow down. Um, and as we were doing that, I, another bullet came in and I got shot again in the foot. Um, but luckily we kind of knew straight away that wasn't going to yeah. be too much of a drama. It stung, but yeah. there's not a great deal. Of, there's no arteries down there. So yeah. I wasn't too bothered by that. And then, the team then, I tried to get out of there with the team and after probably 50 or 60 meters worth of crawling and shuffling, I just, I, I'd lost too much blood and I couldn't help them. So then I was 100% uh, reliant on my guys to to basically get me out. Really? Yeah, and then one of the guys got- What got, was going through your mind at this point? Survive. Just fight, fight with everything you've got to stay alive. Really? You, you feel the life draining out of you. Really? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And you can feel, you can feel yourself going and you can feel yourself fading. And, uh, and what does that feel like? Uh, initially, it's it's like people talk about fight or flight kind of mindsets. Yeah. And mine was fight. You're just fighting aggressively with everything you've got to keep going. Mm. And then towards the end, when you are fading, it's actually quite therapeutic. Really? Yeah, I, I did. I was, I was quite relaxed. <laughs> but by that point, luckily, the boys had got me back into a position of, you know, we're still under contact and we're still rounds coming in, but we had some cover. Right. So I was down... Uh, my medic who was... So in the initial bit, after the first... So after the first shot went through and you did the backflip... Yeah. And you're there holding... Trying to hold your artery together and they're... they're well, trying, I was to, trying to get a hand in to clamp it. To clamp it. Yeah, which I failed to do. And that was still in the same open contact space. Yeah. So they were there 
like still shooting away at you while yeah, you're yeah, there. Yeah, there's still a firefight going on. Yeah, so your team are you know, trying to engage them and they're trying to engage you. And then you do what's called a fighting withdrawal. So you're trying to suppress the enemy with firepower whilst you pull your casualties out. So were you still out. shooting with the other arm? No, I, at this point I couldn't do anything. Right. Yeah, I, I was completely combat ineffective. So I had to, I had to get... You know, that some proper Rambo shit if you were still shooting with the other one. Uh, <laughs> I'd have also been dead pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so then you you managed to retract to a point of relative safety. My team managed to get me back, yet. Yeah. Um, phenomenal effort by all of the guys involved. Wow. And then uh, our medic, who was a really experienced, awesome medic, managed to achieve what we'd failed to achieve in 15 minutes in about 90 seconds to <laughs> stop the bleeding, get yeah. some drips into me and get some fluids into me. And then I was lying on a stretcher and a, 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 what's called a MER team, medical emergency team came in on a helicopter, on a Chinook and took a lot of risk. Uh, they were told not to come in by my Sergeant Major, who's a friend. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> good he friend. Told, yeah, good friend, yeah. And he told them not to come in because they were losing me, which yeah. was the right thing for them to do. Yeah. Because uh, the risk of losing a helicopter was significant. Yeah. And it was within, and two, two well, it was within 300 meters of the machine gun positions we were attacking as well. So yeah. they were well within effective range of, that's a lot of risk for an entire t crew to take on. Um, so we told them not to come in. And then the pilot, who ultimately in the army, different people have the authority to make different decisions and own the risk basically. And the pilot owns the risk of the helicopter and he decided to come in, luckily for me. And, uh, and the medical team came out and, uh, and they then put me on a helicopter. I was still conscious at this point. And they came with the medic saying to me, have you had any morphine? And I said, no. And she said, you want some? And I was like, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> so she gave me some morphine and then, uh, and then she said, can you feel that? I was like, not really. Yeah. And she said, you want another one? So I was like, yeah. And about 10 seconds later, I was in Cocky Land. Uh, it was quite surreal. Um, and then we landed probably about 15, 20 minutes later. And there was an ambulance waiting for me at the uh, at the hospital in Camp Bastion. And uh, yeah, off that helicopter into the ambulance, from the ambulance into the operating table. And last thing I remember was seeing the doctor and the surgeon on the surgery table. And he just said, I'm going to put you into a coma now and you're going to wake up in Birmingham. And that's what happened. They put me into a medically induced coma. And I've since found out several years later that I had two medical teams working on me for 10 hours straight wow. um, to do a, something called a vein graft initially to try and save my life and reconnect the blood flow to the arm. And then they did a, an aero med. So got me onto a, a medical um, hospital plane, basically, mm -hmm. and flew me back to, to Birmingham to a place called Shelly Oak, which is where all the military casualties were going to at the time. Uh, and then I woke up in intensive care there a day later. Wow. So you've woke up in Birmingham after an induced coma, and what are you thinking? Uh, well, at the time, I came kind of waking up and I had a tube down my throat, and lines coming out of me everywhere. And I came uh, looking up and I saw my mum, my, my, my dad, and my sister, and two of my mates who were other officers in the army. And the first thing I did was they got a, I couldn't speak because I had a tube down my throat. Yeah. So. My arm was kind of completely immobilized into my chest and I was lying prone. And so they got a, a pen and pad mm -hmm. and I couldn't really move my arms. So I could just write with just my, my hands. So they put the pad in front of me and then I sketched out uh, in kind of one letter at a time, looking at my mate, still ugly. <laughs> uh, that was the first thing that I did. <laughs> um, wow. And then it was a bit of a, I was on a lot of medication. I was on a lot of morphine at the time. So the next, I, was, I know that was in ITU for nine days. Right, and that was, in, and that was, you know, that they were looked after me really well there, and then I went up from there onto the ward. And I was in the ward for, I think, five or six weeks then. Right, um, and that's, you know, that was a challenging time. You know, you've, you're learning that you've doctors start speaking to you about the impact of the injury and what's happened, and yeah. they go through um, as best they can what they. Do you, do you remember happening. the first time? <clears throat> so, do you remember the first time that the doctor said to you that? you're not gonna have use of your arm again? Well, they didn't, they, they didn't know. Yeah, right. so I thought, I, I, can't remember, I had a phone call about a month into being in there to my boss who was in Afghan at the time, I was on a satellite phone to him. And I said, uh, yeah, sorry boss, I'm alive, I've had a bit of a hit, but I'll be back out on the ground in about six weeks, so I'll see you out there. <laughs> and I was you know, completely unaware of the severity of the injury. Mm. Um, and I, I just thought because the arm was still there, mm. you know, the docs would do what they do and it'd start working again and I'd, you know, do a bit of fizz and get back out there. Yeah. So uh, So at that point, were you willing to go back out there? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. I was desperate to get back out. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the even after there. you, even after you just nearly died, you yeah, still... But I, yeah, I, like I said earlier, I, 
you know, I love the job. I wanted that job. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, don't get me wrong, there's, you know, war is horrific. It really is, mm. you know, but the job of soldiering mm. and the pleasure of commanding paratroopers yeah. is a very unique role. Yeah. And it's one that I really enjoyed. You know? And plus, a lot of the things, it wasn't all combat. You know, mm. we were doing a hell of a lot of good for people on the ground out there as well, yeah. you know, which never gets reported on. Yeah, you know, but you're, you're the people that are receiving education for the yeah. first time in their lives, you know, first time in generations. Mm. People getting access to medical care for the first time in generations. Yeah. You know, and well, the news of, only wants to sell negative stories, don't they? Yeah, they want, they want to sell. And unfortunately, we live, and misery well, we live in a world, yeah. unfortunately, where, where negative press and sensationalist stories sell, yeah. which is which shapes a lot of media, unfortunately. I, th I suppose that is <clears throat> that shapes the the impression of the British of an element of the British public that well, would, of course it would does. be quite against what yeah. was going on over there, yeah. because they're not seeing the benefits or they're only reading about. Oh, people British soldiers dying. Yeah, fighting, there's a lot killing. of misinformation and people aren't informed. Mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing it now with the pandemic. Yeah. yeah misinformation is rife. Yeah. And it actually takes a lot of an individual's part to become well informed mm -hmm. with accurate information. Yeah. And, and so on, the majority of the population haven't got the time or the inclination, unfortunately, to do that. Yeah. So yeah. it doesn't happen. Yeah. So, so that has an impact. But I wanted to get back out. Yeah. Um, and. So at first I was, but I was aware that I was in a bad way. You know, I couldn't do anything for myself. I was a hundred percent reliant on the nursing team and my family to, <coughs> to do everything for me. You yeah. know, I couldn't even go to the toilet myself. They had to pick me up out of the bed to put me on a wheelchair, which had a little hole in it. Well, to I suppose wheel you, me. you thought I'd been shot as well, hadn't it? Yeah, but that wasn't that wasn't too much of a drama. It was more the the you know, the loss of blood and the, right. the I had to keep my arm completely immobilised because I had a vein graft. Yeah, in order for the graft to kind of have a chance so of working, I couldn't all. move the arm at all. Right. So I was completely static, completely still, and um, you know for five weeks, uh, and then even to go to the toilet, they'd have to lift me out of the bed put me onto this wheelchair mm -hmm. with a hole in it to then steer me over the toilet to then do yeah. a business and then help me clean up as well because I couldn't do that. So I suppose was a... going from being captain out in Afghanistan, leaving the team, doing pretty dangerous work to then being totally dependent on like family and, and nurses must have been like psychologically, I suppose that must have been a pretty big deal to, to sort of get your head around. Yeah, I mean, arguably it was the greatest part of the challenge. Yeah. You know, you're going from a position of significant responsibility at quite a young age mm -hmm. in a very you know, high pressured environment yeah. to not being able to put your backside for yourself. Yeah. You know, it's un it unbelievable change in 24 hours, mm -hmm. you know? So <clears throat> what do you do? You know, do you allow it to destroy you mm -hmm. or do you act to maximize the chances of getting some form of recovery? Yeah. And a couple of things happened. First of all, uh, a guy who's I've since come to know, uh, who was a double amputee, mm. wheeled past in his wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, and I saw that and thought, all right, you lost your use of your arm, but it ain't that bad. Yeah. Crack on kind of thing. Yeah, it could be worse. And then, uh, and then my mum and dad went out and bought me key stage one, two, and three handwriting books. Right. And I just said, right, I want to start learning to do, because I was right-hand dominant, so I want to start learning to do basic functional tasks with my left hand. Right, okay. And I started with just learning to clean my teeth. Yeah, you know, with your left If you've hand. not got an electric toothbrush and you use the old school one, which mm. electric toothbrushes then didn't really exist, <laughs> well, not my not my budget anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, use a traditional toothbrush with your non-dominant hand and mm. it feels a bit weird yeah. until you get used to it. Yeah. So I started, I said, today I'm going to learn to clean my teeth. The next day, I'm going to learn to put on a shirt and do the buttons up with my left hand. Yeah. The next day, I'm going to start writing letters. Um, so, so can I've you got, write now with your left hand? Well, okay. I can, but yeah. it's not as fluent. It's not as fast and yeah. it's not as neat. My writing was never my strong point anyway, but yeah. it's not as uh, as fluent. But, you know, it, it was literally, what, what can I practically do to maximize my chance, chances of having a, <clears throat> you know, some form of recovery here yeah. and getting back into work? Yeah. And how, so what, oh, at the stage that you know that this, that you're not gonna be able to use, you know, your right arm, which is like I said, your, your dominant arm, it's, it's what you've sort of used to, to get you through life to this point. What was that sort of, do you remember, was there a defining moment or was it like a gradual process while it's still not recovering? Or? No, it was a long process because um, after the vein graft, which was the first major operation they did after the one to save my life, they then did a, a something called a nerve graft. So you've got 
uh, in essence, a, a, a core of nerves that come through the brachial plexus, which then span off, and they all, they do all sorts of different things from yeah. temperature regulation, sweating, and f- mus- muscle function, all yeah. sorts, and they'd all gone. So right. they put one nerve from a calf into yeah. my bicep to try and see if that would get some form of contraction back. And that then resulted in me being immobilized again for another six weeks to let that graft take. And then over the next two years, I had 13 operations on the general anesthetic, yeah. exploratory and nerve grafts and different things to try and get some form of functional use back. So the, it took a long time before we'd see what level of functional return I'd get, if any, yeah. uh, to see if I'd be able to stay in the army or not. Yeah. Um, so. That process was a long old So road. all of this time, this two whole, this two year period, you were still wanting to go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was still doing everything I could. All, all of us who were injured in, or the majority of us that were injured in combat at the time with the most serious injuries, would then yeah. go from Selyog to a place called Headley Court, which is mm-hmm. a rehabilitation centre, which was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, an amazing rehabilitation centre with people at the top of their game at what they do in an yeah. environment that is constructive towards getting people as, as as fit as they can with their injury yeah um and so you're actively wanting to try and improve your plight basically right. and work hard to try and get your fitness back and some form of function back did a lot of occupational therapy as well so i started mm-hmm. getting help with how do you cook with one hand yeah you know there's devices you can get to try and put you know yeah. fruit and veg on to stabilize them to try and peel things as yeah. all it's all, it's all different parts of your life you've got to look at when you've got a disability like that as to how you're going to become independent again. Yeah. So you're kind of balancing your time doing that with the operations, with physical rehab and trying to get fitness back. Um, and while, whilst I was down there, um, I had a, went back to my unit to speak to my boss and I said, look, you know, I'm not quite sure how long this rehab's going to take, how many operations I've got. The doctors don't know. Um, therefore, I don't know what kind of jobs I can realistically do. Mm-hmm. And he was he was phenomenal. He said, "Look, you know, you take as long it takes as long as it takes. We will keep you in the army for as long as you need to be in for to, to do this, and we will find you a role that you can do what you want to do." Yeah. Uh, the challenge I had with that is that I joined the army to lead soldiers in combat, yeah. not to sit behind a desk in the UK. Yeah. Um, now that kind of job tends to be called staff jobs in the army, mm. and they come to all officers at some point. But as a young officer, you want to kind of delay yeah. that as long as you can, and you want to yeah. get as much experience leading as you can mm. so i wasn't really that keen on doing a staff job or doing a, a job that was going to keep your desk pound especially yeah. at a time when all of my colleagues and friends yeah. were out fighting so uh, uh, i got an email from a, a chap who knew my boss mm-hmm. who was looking to uh, set up an adaptive sport program right. with injured soldiers and he said look would you have a look at this I spoke to this chap and the first adaptive sport they wanted to do was to take a group of injured soldiers to germany and teach them to ski yeah so I said, right, I'll give that a go. My yeah. boss gave me the time off. So I went to Germany for a week and I met a guy there who ran the army ski team. And mm-hmm. he said, I'd love to set up a disabled ski team, but I haven't got the time to kind of be out here all the time doing it. We're getting a few guys together to make it happen. Are you interested? So I, I'd skied before, not mm-hmm. a great deal, but I'd done a bit of skiing. Mm-hmm. Spoke to uh, spoke to a few of my chain of command and said, look, this is an idea. What do you think? And they, they gave me the time. I said, I think I, I could balance doing this. and It'd be a good focus in between my operations to, to get fit. Um, so we set up a, a disabled ski team of injured soldiers to race against able-bodied soldiers. Started doing that. And then 18 months later, before I knew it, I was racing for Great Britain on the Paralympic ski team. Wow. Um, I had on the development team for them, and then went pro and spent three years preparing to go to the Paralympics as a ski racer. As a pro skier? Yeah, I wouldn't describe myself as a pro skier though. Well, well I was a pro skier. I was doing a full time. paid but... to ski, weren't you? Well, yeah, so, I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. And I was on the GB <laughs> squad, but I wasn't. I didn't. I don't. I, I got to a point with kind of with the Paralympics or yeah. the Paralympic sport. It, it's all down to factor and how many people are doing it and yeah. competition levels. And in my sport, there was quite a lot of people doing it, and they, they were pretty good as well. So I got to kind of development level and did yeah. some national championships and did well there. Raced at Europa Cup level, did okay there, and then got onto the World Cup team, and then got my ass kicked. <laughs> they were pretty good, uh, and, uh, and they've been racing since they were kids, and 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 and, and I'd kind of hit the sport quite late, and then I'd, I'd basically a combination of me yeah. feeling like I'd hit a bit of a talent peak, yeah, uh, with the fact that we were doing it on a bit of a shoestring budget, and our competitors were pretty well funded, and yeah. had a pretty good team around them. So I was like, I'm. Um, 
by that point, I've been doing it for a few years. I was like, I'm not doing this for a lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. which Where some, were you at somewhere. psychologically at this point? And then were you? Well, I think the, the great you thing with that, the army was. Yeah, was, I think the great thing with that was that it, it gave me a gradual kind of process to not. not I hadn't left at this point. I was still in the army. Yeah, because it was good for the army to have you know to have people representing their country and adaptive in adaptive sport Olympics, in the Paralympics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I was still in. So that was fantastic, and I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. So I, I started to think about what else I could do then, and psychologically I had to start preparing myself for the fact that I wasn't probably going to get a full recovery. The functional return of use wasn't going to happen, mm. and so I had to start thinking about leaving the army. Um, but because I was ski racing full time, that was kind of that was a job, and yeah. I was I took it seriously, and I was I was committed to it. Um, and then when I realised that you know, I wasn't going to make it, I wasn't going to get gold. Therefore, yeah. I wasn't interested in doing it. Yeah, um, it's funny. Isn't it? It's funny isn't it like when you when you do something. It's I'm, I'm, I'm guessing me and you is similar in the sense that if I do something, I have to do it to an extreme level or to the highest level possible. That you can, yeah, yeah. And then I think once you get to a point where oh, it's only going to go so far, it's, you get you lose a bit of interest, don't you? And you get well, like, some do, some don't. Yeah. Everyone's different. Yeah. But for me, it was yeah, I. I didn't, I kind of fell into that almost. It mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, I never grew up wanting to become a ski racer as such. Yeah. That was a, an opportunity presented to me, which I was very fortunate to get. And I yeah. thought it would be a great tool in transition, mm -hmm. um, which it was. So, but when I, when you then start doing this at performance level, you know, and that was when I was like, well, being a full-time athlete, it's a commitment. It really is. Yeah. You know, your diet is looked at. Yeah. I had to write down everything I was eating the whole time, which yeah. something wrong was fine. I was teetotal. You yeah. know, you signed an athlete's contract. Yeah. You know, I've never been a, I've never been one for not enjoying a night out with my mates. So yeah. that was a challenge as well. Yeah. Uh, and so I was a huge. <clears throat> you know, you've got to be disciplined with it. Yeah. It's, there's similarities to the military. It's yeah. nowhere near as. I would, I don't think it's as, as much of a commitment as you know leading soldiers on combat is, but no, it's a commitment. Not. Yeah. So it's uh, you've got to take it seriously. And in, then you ask yourself, well, why are you doing it? And, yeah. if, and for me, I was doing it to, to win. Yeah. And if the, if the chances of me winning weren't there for one reason or another, which I didn't think they were, mm. there's no putting waste of my time. Yeah. So luckily at that point, I received an email which just was titled North Pole. Right, okay. And I just, I come down, I'd actually just finished the race. Yeah. I finished the giant stalling race. Not done very well in it either. <laughs> Crashed. <laughs> I got back a bit pissed yeah. off. Got to a hotel room, opened my computer up, and, and right. then saw this email saying North Pole. And I just thought, whatever this is, I'm going to do it. I'm in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was the first time really that I think since I joined the Paris mm -hmm. that I'd seen something and thought, I want that. Yeah. No matter where it takes, no matter what I've got to do, yeah. I'm having that. And I opened the email up and it was. An email from a, a new charity that was being established that was trying to fund education courses for injured veterans right um by doing an expedition that never happened before so they wanted to take a team of disabled veterans to the north pole and no one with a disability had ever walked on support to the north pole before so i thought this is going to be pretty punchy and i like the idea of that yeah i'm in so i replied uh and said look introduce myself they invited me along to a, a selection process which I attended and, and passed. Yeah. And then... And that's what became the BBC show Walking With The Wounded. Well, the charity was called Walking With The Wounded. Yeah. It was, was established that we yeah. were raising the money for. And the TV show on BBC One was called Harry's Art of Heroes. Yeah. Um, His Royal Highness joined us on the expedition. So mm. we had a team of eight when His Royal Highness was with us. Uh, we had a, a polar guide mm -hmm. who was phenomenal. He knew his stuff. He was really impressive. Um, not the best on, the, on night out. Mm -hmm. His sense of humour wasn't quite the same as ours, but yeah. he knew his stuff on the ice. Mm -hmm. Really good. And we had the two founders of the charity, mm -hmm. uh, who were amazing boys themselves. And then we had an injured lad, who uh, another officer in the Light Dragoons, who'd amputated his leg with other, with other knee. Yeah. We had a guy from the Welsh Guards who'd broken his back in seven places, I think, who was literally bed prone for, I think, nine months, yeah. who was told he was never going to walk again. Um, another paratrooper who'd been blown up with an RPG and lost his arm and a lot of the muscle from his leg. Wow. And me with a paralyzed arm. Um, and then for part of the trip, Prince Harry was with us. Um, so I where did you start from? So we, well, we, so I, it was, it was kind of in stages. So I, I got into the team a little bit ahead of some of the other boys. We actually, we actually had to run two selection processes, excuse me, because the first team that we picked became apparent that a few of them just weren't going to make it. You know, yeah. physically, they, they unfortunately weren't in a position to, to get to the standard within the time frame. And the other power trooper, a guy called Jacko, when he first applied, he still had a clostomy bag in from his operation. And he, he'd not long come out of hospital. Yeah. 
And so we'd applied and we looked at him and, and, the, and the two founders of the charity said, there's no way this kid's going to be ready in time. Yeah. Go away kind of thing. Yeah. So we went away and paratroopers being trapped, paratroopers kind of threw himself back into his fizz. Yeah. Went and did a marathon in Kenya. He then joined the ski team that I was the captain of in the, in the military. Right. So I was getting kind of feedback from them as to how he was and yeah. how his rehab was going and his yeah. fitness. And um, I went and saw him down in St. Athen and he was badgering me to give him another shot with this. Yeah. So I went back to the two charity founders yeah. and said, this kid needs to be looked at again. Yeah. And he, when he was a kid then, he was very young. And, uh, and they did. And fair play to him, he was strong as an ox. So we had him on. Yeah. So yeah, so there was, uh, so we were kind of two phases. So by the time the team was together, we started in the UK, we took people through like a round robin. So you mm -hmm. saw a strength and conditioning coach, physiotherapist, mm -hmm. a doctor. Yeah. We went down to the Royal Naval Institute of Cold, Me Cold Weather Medicine um, to get tests down there, thermal yeah. tests to see how we operate VO2 max assessments. What time of year did you go? Uh, for the North Pole, you go. You, you want to go in the spring. Yeah. So we're, for everything in the Arctic, you want to, go as early as you can at the end of the winter to maximize yeah. your kind of time frame the thing I, with i did a show once in um it's ireland in the not far north of norway called Kalsoy. Right. and that was in that was in like august yeah and it never went dark and i remember thinking i remember craving night so badly that yeah so i mean you wouldn't want to go in the summer, would you? You'd want to. You'd want well, you to. You can't do... because so, so the, so, well, North Pole, you, Ar Arctic sea ice. You got basically the, you got an environment there which is. A lot of people kind of get it, think that the North and South Pole is the same. You know, where you've got Antarctica, you've got a landmass continent yeah. with snow and ice on top. North Pole, you've just got sea ice, which is frozen. So there's currents underneath it. And that sea ice thickness is constantly changing. So there's no landmass up there? No, it's just frozen water. And, oh, that, wow. and that changes throughout the seasons. So you've got, a, you've got a weather window to be able to do anything up there in. So during the winter, it's, it's one, it's flipping cold so you can't do a great job yeah. anyway 24 hour darkness of course yeah and then the season changes as spring comes in you then get 24 hour sunlight but it's still very cold but the sea ice is thick enough for you to be able to walk on and yeah. do things on what it used to be last few seasons it's not been able to do anything because of climate change right the th ice is getting thinner and thinner and starting to dissipate so when we were there in 2011 we went out at the beginning of, uh, of so even in that 10 year period it's changed that much oh yeah 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 yeah. So this climate change is really having an effect on 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 all the areas of in every environment I've been to. We, we've been to Chamonix every year for the past twelve years, and there's no doubt I've seen reduction in that glacier every year that we've been there. Um, all the major glaciers around the world, all the evidence, all the scientific data coming out is demonstrating, suggesting that climate change is real. <laughs> and and what, be, what would be your prediction on how this is going to continue? With, with, with well, I'm not a scientist. I've got no idea. But based all I can say, from, from, experience from of personal the experience, first time experience of us seeing the, the the alarming concern is the pace of change. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we're seeing that with more frequent extreme weather events around the world. Yeah. You know, in our environment, when we go to the, you know, the, even the difference, the difference in when we climbed Everest, the difference. I attended Everest for the first time in 2012, and then 2019 we went back and summited it. And in that time frame, the one of the major features of the route that we were on was an area called the Cumbria Ice Field. Mm. And left and right of that, there's an enormous amount of seracs, which are basically huge areas, blocks of ice attached to the mountain. Mm -hmm. Now earthquakes have reduced some of that, but climate change to reduce the size of some of those crevasses, crevasses and I mean some of those uh, seracs and the uh, Cumber Ice Field itself is changing you know between you know, 2012 and 2019 some of the climatization walks that we do going into that area mm. and looking at the size of it there was a significant reduction in the size of that ice field over wow. that time frame so it, it, it's happening yeah. yeah from what I've seen and I'm, I'm and not that was 2011 so when well, you... 2012 was the first time I was in Himalayas so 2019 was the last time I was there right and there's significant change from what I saw there yeah I and mean, we were there at the same time of year right so we're going back to the North Pole we, we kind of deployed on that in late March yeah um, early April and uh and you've got a set time frame to get there before yeah. basically the sea ice becomes too thin for you to walk on or to operate on. So from a planning consideration, you've got to look at what distance you want to do, yeah. how many miles a day you've got to average, yeah. and therefore kind of when you need to deploy, because you've got to be off the ice by, I think it was the 24th of April, yeah. we had to be off the ice, because at that point, um, the ice gets too thin for the aircraft to come in and land safely to get you out. 
So you actually you you're gone basically. Well, you're in water. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You stay out there too long. Swim. You're swimming home, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't fancy the idea of. So would you sure. start in Sweden or Norway? No, or? well, we well, we started on the ice itself. So we, there's an area, there's a collection of islands called Spitsbergen Svalbard, up yeah. in northern Norway. So north of the mainland. Yeah. And um, we, the capital of the place called Longyearbyen, and we did a lot of our training up there. Yeah. Went up there multiple times, just training to dragon sledges, and then that's the kind of the the final logistics hub, if you like. Yeah. And we then deployed from there by um, by plane to Svalbard uh, to uh, to uh, like a like a tactical ice landing strip almost called Barneo. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a Russian guy called Victor who runs a team up there. Really impressive. They fly over in an aircraft, and out the back of the aircraft they push out a, a JCB, a free fall team, and a lot of uh, bull, a, a lot of oil cans. Yeah. And they bulldoze a runway in the ice, and then they land the aircraft and they basically make a camp on this ice airfield right. and that's the logistics base and you then land in there and then there's helicopters there and you then deploy from there to wherever you're starting your expedition from so we we did two degrees yeah uh, or just over two degrees i think on our expedition um so we did you know something between 130 150 miles something like that we did wow yeah and over what sort of time period well, we were planning to do it over a month um, because part of our planning consideration was that we'd lose one day in five mm -hmm. with uh, with weather. So one of the challenges that you've got with the Arctic is that underneath this uh, pack ice, you've got the sea current and that current can pull packs of ice apart, which creates something called open water leads, which is basically just exactly that, it's just open water. And that's an obstacle to cross. Um, and you've got to try and get around that, get or get over it. So you either put a dry suit on and swim through it. You yeah. use the sledges or yeah. pulks as a raft to get across it, or you can kind of run and jump across it if it's fairly narrow. Yeah. Or you keep on walking along it until it gets narrower to, to cross it. Or you get areas of uh, rubble fields and pressure ridges where this current underneath the pack ice pushes it together, yeah. and one strong pack of ice will force the weaker pack of ice to crumble, and it forms a pressure ridge or a rubble field, and you've got to kind of navigate through all of that. Um, so you've, you, when you've got an open water lead, um, that presents a danger of obviously going into it and, and falling through it. Now, when the wind speed picks up, you can get something called spin drift, which is all the kind of loose snow and ice on the on the on the base level that starts moving at a pace that you can't then see the ground right. in front of you. So if you get a wind speed of around fifty mile an hour plus, spin drift picks up to the point where you can't see the open water leads. So you then have to basically pitch tent and go to ground until, until it, the weather until improves, ground. or you take the risk of you know falling into the, falling through, the falling through the ice into the sink, which you don't want to take. Is there any wildlife up there? Well, polar bears. Yeah, polar bears is the only kind of predominant wildlife for the seals. We didn't see anything though. In training, we saw two polar bears. Yeah. Uh, we, we, so they just live on the ice itself? Yeah, well, they live, their main uh, habitat is is on Svalbard itself. But as the kind of summer comes, they'll push further north onto the, where, where it's colder. Right. Uh, so they, they push further and further north. And that presents a risk itself because they're more hungry as the season goes on. Yeah. So they're a greater threat. I heard they don't experience fear. I've got oh, no idea. Yes. I never asked one. <laughs> Did you see any out there? We saw two in training, but yeah. not one. We didn't see any on the expedition. Thankfully, we, we yeah. didn't want it because you don't want to have to, you know, they come at you. You, you don't, don't want to have to kill them. them off, do you? Yeah, no. so we were armed. We had a shotgun and a rifle just in yeah. case. We had flare guns. Yeah. But we said we had a kind of a, a procedure in our team where we said if we see anyone at distance and there's no messing around, no trying to take photos of it, we're just yeah. going to get the flare guns out and dissuade it from getting close yeah. to us as soon as possible because we don't have to shoot one. Yeah. But luckily, we didn't. We didn't see any, so yeah. we we're fortunate. So 150 days? Uh, no, so it was just no. over, we were hoping to do it in around a month, but we ended yeah. up doing it in just over two weeks in the end. Right. Oh, really? We were very fortunate with the weather. It was cold, but we didn't have a single day where we couldn't walk. So right. we managed to walk every day and we became more efficient as kind of time went on as well. So we, you know, the speed at which we could cross the terrain mm -hmm. improved. So we ended up doing, some days we ended up doing double the distance we were anticipating doing wow. in our planning. So uh, yeah, we were pretty lucky with that. And did you have to walk back? No, we, we <laughs> cheated. So when we got there, yeah, again, time of year, you know, the spring comes in, yeah. melt, you know, the ice, the, the the ice pack will start to melt. You know, you, you can't walk back. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, you get it. We got to, as yeah, soon as we got there, off. got the old GPS out yeah. to make sure that we were on, on site and yeah. in the right place. We pitched tent there that night, but because yeah. the pack ice is constantly moving, yeah. when we woke up the next morning, we were about a mile away from the North Pole. Really? Because uh, obviously the, the current's taking you away. So we then uh, we then got the helicopters in to pick us up and, and take us off. Right, wow. Yeah. 
And then back to Svalbard, which is this place that we launched from. Had a, a few drinks there to celebrate, yeah, one or two. <laughs> and, a, and a bite to eat as well, because yeah. we've been eating freeze-dried rations for the expedition. Yeah. Um, so we had some proper steak and, yeah. and, and fresh veg. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and, and then home. drinks, nice. Yeah, yeah. No, it was awesome. And it was that, to be honest with you, that kind of was a, the, the, for me, was the, the catalyst for change in, right. in what I was going to do. I then left the military and uh, I then started looking at what I wanted to do next and what I was going to transition into. Um, and I enjoyed, I'd met a lot of people by this point with different disabilities through the yeah. Paralympics and through and through the military. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed leading expeditions and taking yeah. people away on what I perceived to be genuine challenge events. Yeah. Um, so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. So I set up an organization to start taking people away on on challenges and expeditions. So in 2019, you led an expedition up Mount Everest and summited for the first time. It was your second attempt though, right? Yeah, it was second yeah. attempt. Yeah, our first attempt in 2012, we, yeah. we got acclimatized, which yeah. is basically when you go into high altitude mountaineering, you go through an acclimatization process. Mm -hmm. So the, the atmospheric conditions up at 8,000 meters are very yeah. different to sea level. So your body so 8, can't- 8,000 meters base camp. No, so base camp on Everest is three, about three and a half thousand meters. Okay. Uh, it depends on what part of... And you've got to walk there, right? In fact, so, no, I'm, I'm telling a lie, sorry. Base camp on Everest is about five and a half thousand meters. Right. So you, most, it depends on, there's two main routes up to Everest. You've got the north side from Tibet mm -hmm. or the south side from Nepal. And we, we, we did the south side from Nepal. So base camp is still higher than Snowden. Significantly. Yeah. yeah five times, more than five times higher than Snowden wow. base camp. Yeah, so we landed in a place called Lukla. Mm -hmm. uh, from Kathmandu, yeah. and that's at 3,100 meters. Yeah. And then we did a 10-day trek from there to Everest Base Camp, right? Um, which you could do in a couple of days, but you want to acclimatize. Yeah. So your the atmospheric conditions up 8,000 meters are very different to, to, to sea level. Mm -hmm. So your body has physiologically got to adapt to be able to operate in that kind of environment, so that yeah. kind of atmospheric So pressure. what's that process like? Horrendous. Right. <laughs> for me, <laughs> it's different for everyone. Yeah, and it, to be honest, I've had different experiences every time. I've what done are it. the symptoms of altitude sickness? Well, you've got different levels of altitude sickness. So you have something called AMS, acute mountain sickness, and that's you can get headaches, you can feel nausea, you can be sick off that, um, and then things to develop. Things can develop into something that's really quite serious. You can get a cerebral edema or a pulmonary edema, which is liquid on the brain or liquid on the lungs, and that can be deadly. So. Right. Altitude sickness is something that you need to take very seriously. Yeah. Um, is there medication for it? There's a there's a drug that I've used in the past called Diamox, which you can take, which for me has worked really well. Mm -hmm. um, we've never taken it as a precursor. We've always just taken it if we've needed it. But there's different schools of thought in the medical space as to whether you should take it as a as a kind of as part of your preparation, or mm -hmm. you should just take it if you need it. Um, uh, and does that what relieve some of the symptoms? It does, yeah, and it, and it helps some of the symptoms. Uh, it also makes you urinate more frequently, so you've yeah. got to look at your hydration. Yeah, uh, trying to remain hydrated. Does it help is you to acclimatize easier though? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how the drug works, to be honest yeah. with you, but I just know that it works right. and it, it does help. Work for you? It worked for me. Yeah. I took it on the. On, I've taken it on. So I've, so I've done four, five, four or five different seven thousand meter meter expeditions mm. now and three 8,000 meter expeditions, probably 12 or 15, mm -hmm. six and seven, uh, five and 6,000 meter expeditions. And I've probably used that on maybe, we've only used it on this on the 8,000 meter trips. Oh, I, no, I, use, I use it on one of the 7,000 meter, I used it on Aconcagua once actually because I was having a yeah. bad headache day. So I've used it once there and I used it twice on 8,000 meter peaks. Right. And it's worked on all three occasions for me. At what height do you start feeling? That varies. Um, it, for I normally start to feel something at about four and a half to five thousand meters. Right, you know, headache and a bit of nausea, maybe. Mm. Um, between five and six thousand, you then definitely get in a proper headache, and you're mm. going to definitely start feeling sick. Yeah, um, you're short of breath. Uh, everything becomes physically harder to do. Yeah, um, between six and seven thousand meters, the world changes quite significantly right um, everything becomes a lot harder yeah uh, breathing becomes more difficult yeah. uh, you you tend to reduce the amount of steps you can take before is you that can... just due to a lack of oxygen in the it's, air it's due to a lack of your body's ability to utilize the oxygen right so because it's thinner because the oxygen because the atmospheric pressures changed right. it, it's greater yeah okay so it's harder for your body to utilize it um and that's yeah that, that's what makes it you know more difficult basically to get the physical mm. tasks done 
and it also reduces your appetite. Mm. Um, and then when you get above 8,000 meters, you're into an area that's kind of known as the death zone. Yeah. It's actually a little bit, it's commonly described as 8,000 meters, but it's actually a little bit lower than that. It's about yeah. seven, nine. Um, but base camp's five, right? Say, was it base camp's about five. It depends. Base camp actually spreads a huge, expansive area. Yeah. And it spans from an altitude of about 5,100 to 5,300. Right. It's gradually rising up the valley, yeah. so it depends on whereabouts you are. Right. Uh, but it's about, yeah, five, one to five, three. So from from my understanding of climbing Everest, it was that you, you get to base camp, you acclimatize there, and then you go base camp, camp one, back, camp two, back, camp three, back, and... Essentially, you gradually work your way up, come back down, work your way up. Is, is that is that the your experience of that's well, that's roughly people, different teams take different approaches to it. Yeah, it depends on it depends on the threat from the mountain. Yeah, that kind of should dictate what your acclimatization plan is. Mm -hmm. So there's controllable risk and uncontrollable risk. Mm -hmm. The challenge with Everest is that you've got to go up from the south side. Is that you're going through an area called the Cumbria Ice Field. Yeah, and that's an area where there's a great deal of uncontrollable risk. You've got seracs on either side of the of the valley that you're going through which are these huge big blocks of ice on the side of the mountain, which are prone to avalanche. And you're in a v the base of a V-shaped valley, so there's not a great deal of protection yeah. should an avalanche fall into that area. Yeah. So you want to minimize the amount of transitions of, uh, that you go through there at. Yeah. Um, now, Camp 1 on Everest on the south side isn't situated in the best of places. So you're still in the kind of avalanche risk area. Yeah. It's not as great as... How the, high is Camp 1? It's about six... It's about five... About five, eight, five, nine... Right. Um, and then Camp 2 is kind of further up in a, an area called the Western Coombe. Yeah. And that's at about 6.162. Um, so if you can, from the climatization perspective, to go from 5.3 five, five, to 6.2 in one go is a bit of a no-no. Right. You know, unless you're very experienced and you tend to do well at altitude, yeah. you're probably going to suffer if you do that. So most teams will go to Camp 1, touch it and come back. Mm -hmm. Some will go and stay there and then come back. And what, what's summit height? 8,848 meters. Jesus, so you're but the, just but, over halfway when you get to base. Well, you are, and you know what I mean? Climbing as you get higher becomes exponentially more difficult yeah. physically because of the changing atmospheric conditions. Yeah. And technically on Everest as well. I mean, Everest isn't the most technical of mountains to climb, yeah. uh, but there's a few kind of features that you've got to move around which can slow things down as you yeah. get higher up. Um, so we, we actually didn't th that process that you described then going to camp one camp yeah, two yeah. frequently we didn't do yeah we actually went from base camp to camp two yeah and then from camp two to to three to four to, to our summit attempt because we acclimatized um, so you climbing a different mountain called pimori right so you didn't need to come back down then um <clears> no <throat> we, we went up we didn't need to come back down we just we went up and that was us on our summit attempt because right. we'd already acclimatized to to 7,100 meters on Pumori. And so did you have to time all of that? So climbing the yeah. other mountain, doing camp two, and then your summit attempt? Yeah, so with 8,000 meter peaks, you're looking <clears> at, <throat> you've got a weather window to get up there into mm. summit. Yeah. Um, so there's two times during the year when the kind of weather window presents itself. Yeah. Normally around May, um, kind of most of the month of May, you can get, a, sometimes you could get a really early window or a real late window, but normally kind of mid to late May is the optimum, yeah. most frequent summit days. And then there's a time in September and that's seasonal shifts when the monsoon shift happens basically. Yeah. So there's a, a, a there's a, a weather system that ex exists up there yeah. that gets pushed north and the wind speed is then reduced, okay? And that basically opens up an opportunity for climbers to kind of get up there without experiencing 100 mile an hour, 150 mile an hour winds on a daily basis. Um, so, I mean, there is a chance you could try and get a good weather day in, in winter, yeah. but there's not many winter Everest summit attempts. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's risky and it's an expensive it, trip as well, isn't it? it? It's, it's, it's higher risk. So you're looking at, you know, why are you doing it? But there's people, obviously, mm -hmm. a winter sense of Everest without oxygen yeah. is a more impressive endeavor. Yeah. But personally, I would never go for that without having a hell of a lot of experience first. <laughs> doing it so any time my, of year is... Well, yeah, is, so you... Enough, for, yeah, I mean, <laughs> for my first attempt, you want to you want to <clears throat> gain experience, you want to maximize your chance of success. Yeah. And for us and, and my project in particular, because of some of the people that we take on our expeditions, yeah. we want to minimize the risk. Yeah. You know, so and that was the reason we chose to climb Pumori yeah. um, rather than going up Everest, Cumbu Valley multiple times. Uh, Pomori is another mountain in the area. Mm. Um, you can get to it from base camp, yeah. um, which is 7,100 meters. So by summiting Pomori, that was going to get us acclimatized to a point where we could then go to Everest and through the Cumber Rice Field just once on right. our summit attempt. And Pomori is a, a technically a much more difficult mountain to climb than Everest. Right. So it was going to be a, there's a principle in the military called train hard, fight easy. Yeah. So if we were 
training on Primori, yeah. Everest wasn't going to present anything technically that was going to be as great a challenge to us as what we'd already experienced on Primori. And how long did it take you to get up Primori? Uh, so, <laughs> well, Primori was a different challenge because there's different teams <clears throat> and, and, there's, and there's Nepali climbers that fix the route on Everest for you, yeah. uh, for all the commercial teams that come out there. Um, and that is, yeah, that, that that saves time, pulls resources, yeah. reduces risk. Whereas when we did Primori, it was just our team doing it, so we're fixing the lines ourselves on that. Wow. Um, so our, we had two pro climbers in the team, and we had a we had a couple of Nepali climbers in the team. And the then, Sherpas. Sherpas, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all phenomenal. So they guys. live out there. Yep. Well, the Sherpas the name given to a, so the Nepali group of people from a certain area. Yeah. So a, a certain geographical area within Nepal. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of these guys, have, uh, a lot of the shippers that we use were from uh, an area called Ferrashe, yeah, which is a popular location. And how high is that? What well, like is it? Uh, it... Ferrashe is about four thousand meters. So they're born acclimatized, essentially. Well, well they've bought yeah, they're, well, they're, yeah, they're acclimatized to four thousand meters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got obviously got get acclimatized to be able to climb higher than that. Yeah, but um, but I mean they're so impressive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, we've been. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of different teams out there on Everest now, and this mm. is part of the challenge of the mountain. Yeah, you know, the commercialization of Everest has resulted yeah. in a lot more people going. Yeah, and unfortunately, some commercial operators is not really very professional. Yeah, and so some of the people they're taking, some of the clients they're taking are prepared for Everest. Mm. Some of the Sherpa they're using haven't got any experience. Yeah, some of the so-called guides and leaders. Yeah. I would question whether or not they're suitably qualified to do the job. Do you think that's a factor as in why there is, I mean, there is quite a high death count on oh, Everest, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, think yeah. that's a factor to it? Yeah. Lack yeah. of experience. Yeah, well, lack of experience and, and yeah, no governance. Yeah. And, and and people just paying and it's like 70 odd grand or like 70 Well, it varies. Grand. Yeah. Well, the price point is part of the problem. Yeah. So some of these companies will try and undercut mm. the price points. And the way they will do that is by taking out some of the safety measures. Right. So, you know, they want to maintain their profit margins, yeah. but they don't want to pay for the safety. Right. So they will cut costs by taking safety out, and that's yeah. part of the problem. Right. Um, whereas other companies, you know, we use the company called Himex, mm -hmm. who, you know, Russell Bryce is extremely well known in mm. that space, and is Russell's a character. You know, yeah. he does things the way he does things. Yeah. But he's extremely well respected for yeah. good reason because he knows what he's doing. Um, IMG is another good company that have that have done things well out there. Um, Adventure Consultants is a Kiwi company that are very good out there. Yeah. Um, Jagger Globe, I've never really come across, but they've got a decent reputation. Yeah. So there's, there's yeah, anyone that's going out there that you've you've got a kind of responsibility to yourself and to others to do your due diligence on yeah. who you're going with and who you're commissioning to provide support. Yeah. As you, you kind of expect people to do that, but unfortunately, not everyone does. Yeah. So and there's different costs, of course. Yeah. You know, but the approach I took when we planned ours was that. We want to go with a team that's got a decent reputation. Yeah. We want to maximize our chance of success and minimize our risk. Um, and that means we've got to work hard on the fundraising. You know, that's safety costs what it costs. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah. get the money, basically. So uh, was it busy when you went, the time of year you went? Yeah, yeah, it was. That last 2019 was a particularly, it hit the press for a number of negative reasons, unfortunately. Uh, the issue was that the weather system that needs to move north didn't mm. move north until quite late. So right. it presented only a couple of weather windows to actually go for the summit. Is, so that, had, is that the, or was that the year that they had the queues on Everest? Yeah, yeah well, there's been queues on Everest, building queues on Everest for a few years now. Um, but 2019 was particularly bad. Right. Uh, and that was for a number of reasons, partly because the weather system was, like I said, it didn't push north for a while. Um, but primarily because you've got a combination of a large number of people trying to go into an area where there's choke points at the mm. same time. And there wasn't a great deal of collaboration between the teams to deconflict who was doing what and when. And secondly, you've got people go in there that aren't suitably experienced and qualified. They'll hit a piece of technical ground or they'll get themselves into a situation where they're uncomfortable mm. and they stop. And trying to get around them at these choke points is yeah. very dangerous and very hard work. Yeah. So other people don't necessarily do that. Yeah. So you then get a bottleneck of people forming and you're waiting until they decide to move. And if is, they decide is that around, to move. Is that around the Hillary step? Well, there's different features on the mountain. There. So the yellow band is one technical area. Well, yeah. it's not technical, but it's an area there's a bit of scrambling going on yeah. that you've got to get around. And the, we, we experienced a lot of congestion there. Yeah. The Hillary step area is actually changed now significantly to what it used to be because there was an earthquake in, earthquake in 2015 yeah. that actually resulted in some of the rock on the Hillary Step falling. Right. Um, and so it's actually now technically not as demanding as it used to be. Okay. So the time 
queue that you used to have to get around that feature is less, thankfully, because it would have been even worse had that right. feature still been intact. Um, but there is still a technical move, a semi-technical move you've got to make yeah. on that feature. And you, you're walking across a, an aret that has got you know a 3,000 meter drop on one side and about a 4,500 meter drop on the other side. Yeah. And this is about a foot and a half wide. You know, there's a big bank on one side, but there's a sheer drop on the other side. So yeah. if you're not used to climbing and, and, and exposure and you've not got the experience of doing yeah. that and you freeze, which some people we saw that did, yeah. then everyone's stuck. Was there many deaths on the Martin when you, on the, at the time there you were there? 16 that year. 16. Yeah, and none of them were from avalanches or earthquakes. Just it was all because of, you know, I assume human error of one way or another. All is people, it, is a know. statistic one in three accurate? Of deaths, yeah. No, it's much lower than that. Is no, yeah, than that? yeah, yeah. Not nowhere near that. That's yeah, I'm not sure. That's pretty high, in. that isn't it? One in three. That's what I heard, but it's not that high. I no, can't remember. No, no, it's nowhere near. Well. I'll put it this way: on the year we did it, there was, I think, over a thousand, there was something like eleven hundred permits for the summit right. attempt, right. of which I guesstimate maybe there were nine hundred make it or something, or seven hundred make it. I've no yeah. idea, but there were sixteen deaths. Right. So, so it's not, nothing like. No. That'd have been hundreds then. No, I think, one in three. Yeah, someone's someone's talking rubbish there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably a newspaper. I read that. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, you, you've got to look at when you're planning expeditions in this kind of environment. You've got to look at what are the risks, where are the risks coming from, and how yeah. can you mitigate those risks? Yeah, and a lot of the you know from what I've experienced in that space, a lot of those risks can be mitigated quite significantly through preparation, training, yeah. equipment, using you know having a decent logistical team yeah. in place. And having people primarily in key decision-making positions to yeah. make the right calls at the right time. So you set off. You set off from Camp Two. Um, what for the summit attempt? For the summit attempt. No, from Camp Four, from so early call to South Call. Right. So you go from base camp to we went from base camp straight to Camp Two. Yeah. We then had a, a night in Camp Two. Yeah. Camp Two to Camp Three, yeah. which is about a six hundred and fifty meter vertical climb. Yeah. Um, and a distance probably of about six or seven kilometers. It's not very far. Um, but the impact of altitude is kicking in, obviously. Yeah. Um, is it a significant difference? Can you physically feel yeah, the difference yeah, between yeah. two and six to three? seven? Yeah, uh, five, kind of six to seven things start to change, like I said, and yeah. you do feel it. And then seven to eight, the world changes significantly. And above in what, eight, in, in what sense significantly? Well, just everything becomes hard work. Yeah. You know, you so in in training, yeah. when we were in, like, we would train in the Alps. We go to Europe. We go, we go to Chamonix. We'll train mm -hmm. in an area um, called Grand Massif on there. Yeah. And we'll we'll comfortably with kit on be doing a vertical climb rate of around 700, 800 meters an hour yeah. pace. Yeah. If you were pushing it and you had a day sack on, you know, you'd be kind of expecting about a nine hundred, maybe even a thousand meter an hour pace if you're going for it. Right. Yeah. You know, up there. That's pretty quick. You, well, you prepare. Yeah. You trained. Yeah. If you're, you know, on Everest, if you're above eight thousand meters, you'd be doing well to to be getting one hundred and fifty meter an hour, two hundred mm. meter an hour pace. Right. Okay. Very well. You know, so it, it's it's purely the impact of altitude, right? Uh, and the, the debilitating impact of that on your body. What's so, sleeping like at that altitude? Well, for me, impossible. Yeah. <laughs> for, for some people, you know, some people can sleep, some some can't. I just can't sleep. We, on, on Everest, we used supplementary oxygen, so you've got a respirator on your mouth, which yeah. is dripping kind of liquid into your air every now and then, so yeah. that kind of stops you from sleeping as well. But even if I didn't have that on, I would probably I've, I've done. You know, I've been to 8,000 meters three times and I've never been able to sleep at that kind of height. Really? Yeah. I can get away with about 7.3, 7.4 is the highest, but even then it's broken. You don't right. get, you're not, you're not going to get straight four or straight five. You're going to get yeah. 20 minutes here, half an hour there. Yeah. So you kind of, and, and eating as well, you can't, I can't even snack. Some people can get snacks down. Yeah. I know a few, a few mates and a few kind of mountaineers that can eat a full meal. Yeah. Again, I can't do that. So there's a few things that I can eat. So you're yeah. kind of going on reserves at that point. Yeah. So you so, need a bit of resilience to kind of keep on pushing yourself through then. So at Camp 4, so Camp 4 to Summit, what, what sort of distance is that? So Camp 4 is about 7.9, 7, 9, 7, 9, 50. Yeah. Um, and the Summit, so you're looking at just under 1,000 metres of vertical height game. Right. Um, and is it is it literally vertical, that sort of stretch? What do you mean? So like, 
So, oh, it's vertical so hiking. Yeah, so vertical saying, hiking. Oh, so okay, we're describing so this. We're looking, at, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're looking at distance traveled yeah. as a method of assessing our kind of speed and, and, yeah, yeah. and distance. And then vertical hiking is how many vertical meters we've climbed, basically. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the topography itself, the gradient of the climb yeah. varies. And I mean, the steepest part on Everest is an area, a feature called the Lotsey Wall, yeah. where it's probably somewhere between kind of 42 and 51, maybe, yeah. in, uh, degrees in, in, in gradient. Yeah. So there's nothing which is steep and there's consequences to falling on that. Yeah. And the condition of the Lotsey Wall is significant when it comes to the challenge that it presents in climbing it mm -hmm. and the safety aspect of it. We was blue ice when we did it, so it's quite high risk because there's no, you know, there's no footholds in there. Yeah. So you, you cramp on where it's got to be good. Yeah. Um, but in comparison to Pimori, where it was, you know, we had a nice overhang at 6,200 meters on Pimori and, you know, 70 to 90 degrees in places yeah. frequently. Yeah. Uh, it, it was nothing in comparison to that. Yeah. But it is still challenging, especially at altitude. So the, the gradient changes frequently as you progress up the mountain. Mm -hmm. And how, how long did, would, did it take to get from Camp 4 to the summit? Well, different it's this diff, different for different people. Yeah. I, I departed Camp 4 uh, about quarter past one. In the morning? Uh, yeah, and I got on the summit, I think, at half six. Right. So, which is not bad. That's, that's a decent, decent time. Yeah. Um, I mean, we kind of, we planned, we had an idea of what pace we think we'd be going at. Mm -hmm. So we had an idea for what kind of, you want to kind of get on the summit on Alpine mountaineering at sunrise. Yeah. Um, and the reason for that is that you want to maximize daylight for a start yeah. to, to get down in case there's any challenges or any issues. Yeah. Um, as the sun starts to rise, it hits the snow yeah. and that increases and expands the snow yeah. and the temperature change and that increases the risk of avalanche. Yeah. So you want to be up and down as, as early as possible. Um, so you want to be on there for sunrise. So we, we've gone there just after sunrise. Um, and then yeah, we had about 20 minutes on the summit, which was amazing. What was what it like up there? Phenomenal. I mean, I've read books and listened to people in the past talk about being able to see the curvature of the earth up there, and that's yeah. rubbish. <laughs> Either, I'm still seeing something I'm not, but I didn't see that. Yeah. But you can see a complete tone change in the in the, in the the sky colour from right. the kind of stratosphere coming down to the atmosphere. Wow. From dark, real dark blue to kind of normal sky blue. It's amazing. Because it's 30,000 feet, right? It's similar to yeah, a plane Yeah, so yeah, well, just over, over 39,000 feet. So cruising altitude of a jet aircraft. Yeah, wow. so it's pretty cool. But... Looking at that outside, yeah. when you're stood on it, it's very different to looking at it in a jet aircraft. Yeah, I bet, yeah. Uh, so it was, uh, I mean, it was amazing. It really was. And you've got, you look down one side and you've got Tibet, look down the other side and you've got Nepal. And you've got, I mean, the thing with Everest is you've got Makalu in the distance that you can see. Yeah. You've got Lhotse, Nupse, like just kind of what looks like stone's throw distance, but it's not, but as part of the same immediate range. And then Pumori, which when we were climbing it, felt huge and yeah. hugely challenging. You're looking down on that, uh, you know, it's only 7,100 meters. Yeah. So it is just, it's phenomenal. The yeah. sheer, the scale of that mountain range is unbelievable. Yeah. And it, it kind of puts everything in perspective. It makes you realize how insignificant we are as people on this planet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's yeah. phenomenal. And then uh, for us, one of our pro climbers, who was one of our guides, uh, got on the radio to base camp and pr proposed to his, his girlfriend at the time, his partner. From the summit? From the summit, and she was in base camp waiting, and that was nice. pretty cool. Took her 10 minutes to reply, yeah. so we were waiting for a while. <laughs> I think he was getting a bit nervous at one point. Yeah. Well, we, since we found out uh, kind of after that that she she wasn't expecting it, so she was taking it back. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. And then, uh, and then to be honest, we uh, we we wanted to get down, get off that. that The area where the hilly step is, that final approach is yeah. really narrow, so we wanted to get off that before all the kind of groups that so did you go overtaken. straight back to base camp or did you have to stop no so we actually went down to we should stop it if you can get down to camp two you kind of want to get down to camp two because well, one it's more comfortable yeah and two there's less risk lower down yeah or at camp two than what there is at camp three or camp four yeah um but that's a, it's a big day to do that yeah so we tried to do that and went down to camp two um well all of our team went down to camp two actually apart from me i got to camp three yeah and we had a few challenges on the way down we had to we had an issue with oxygen with one of the team um, who was running out of oxygen because he, he stopped to help somebody else. So right. his oxygen, so we then went down to get a spare bottle to bring back up, so that all took time. And then there was a, a, a guy without oxygen that was doing it, which was pretty impressive. And he was he was having a challenge on the way down, so we tried to kind of come down with, for a bit with him. Yeah. All of these things, and then a few people having a few technical issues getting down, so these all impact your time coming down. Yeah. So I decided to actually stop at Camp 3. And I was doing it all with one arm, so my arm, by this point, some of the repels that I was doing, um, I just didn't want to risk too much lactic building up. Yeah. And we had a tent pitched at Camp 3, so I just decided to stay there for the night. Do and you think having... It's the, a better view. Do you think having the, the use of... 
How much impact do you think it, it, it made on you only having having the one arm to, to, to get up there? Oh, it's significant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, more, more than anything, you want to be climbing with your legs primarily and your footwork is really important. But the big thing with with having one arm is that you, I mean, often you want three points of contact before you make a move. Mm -hmm. So there's a safety implication there. Yeah. Now, the difference between when I do rock climbing and scrambling versus glacial mountaineering yeah. is that the crampons and the ice and the ice axe actually help me. Yeah. It's actually easier for you to get, providing that the terrain that you're on is stable, yeah. for you to get a more secure position than it is on rock. Um, but you've got to work harder because you know, you've only got one arm. Yeah. Um, the big issue I have as well is that because the arm's paralyzed and not amputated, it's a dead weight. Yeah. You don't realize how heavy your limbs are until you can't use them. Right. So it's constantly knocking you off balance. Right. So when you're doing technical climbing, that is an additional consideration. Yeah. Um, but the big thing is with your rucksack, it's just trying to get moves done when you need to reach with your arm and it isn't there. Yeah. So do you feel like you want to use it still? Oh yeah, all the time. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. And you got. Does that never go? So again, did that feeling no, yeah, to use it, it always it, there? It, it changes. You get used to using your left arm. Yeah. Um, but it's it's still there. Mm. So you've got to you've got to remain calm. You've got to think things through. You've got to look at your route. Um, and then there's some things you can do to improve your proficiency through the training. Some of the technical kit you can buy and use. Um, so, I, for example, we sometimes put additional anchor points in if we need to, so you can get. Uh, something called a, uh, an ice screw so you put it into the rock and then you put a device in there that enables you to put a bit of security so keep yourself secure whilst you think about what you're going to do next yeah. um, you can do that uh, but ultimately it all comes down to plotting your route and primarily for me and for our team working with professionals that know what they're doing yeah. who help us you know they help us plot the route we climb ourselves you know but they will help us train and prepare thoroughly for what we're going to go and do so you get back to camp you got to camp three so yeah, you're on camp, camp three. three. Well, so I'm going on camp three. Yeah, I was on camp oh, three. You made sure it's camp cool. two. Yeah, but I told them to carry on to camp two. I mean, the the, the section of climb from three down to two yeah. to descend was I was comfortable with and I was yeah. happy with. So I we would never normally split up on the hill, but I was happy staying there on my own. So yeah. I stayed there, chilled out, listened, looked across the valley because from camp three you got a real good view down the Western Coombe and that looking at you can even see base camp from up there and yeah. Pumori so looking at all of that that was fantastic and, and, and acclimatisation wise were you feeling well you're feeling like you're on top of the world now yeah. like you've, you've literally just been on top of the world and yeah. every step down is you know, it's making it easier it's, it, I'd say realistically about every you kind of start to notice it about every kind of 100 150 metre descent right. you start to feel you know, like a little bit of relief yeah yeah, yeah 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 and of course physically the physical effort of descending yeah. is far less challenging the, the physical effort of climbing however yeah. it's technically much more dangerous right so descends so you've got to be mentally you've got to stay switched on yeah and you've got to think about your footwork because uh, it's easy to make a mistake and to yeah. trip up um and that's when a lot of deaths actually in mountaineering come from the descent rather than right. climbing um so you've got to stay switched on with it uh, but we then went down to camp two we had a, a night in camp two yeah and then from there we then we decided to stay night in camp two just because we wanted to be you know, kind of fresh for going through the ice fall yeah. uh, for the Cumber Ice Field because that's where there is a lot of uncontrollable risk with avalanches. So we wanted yeah. to be kind of switched on for that. Yeah. Um, and then back to base camp and saw Russ, who was our kind of expedition leader and, yeah. and guy that made all of our logistics and made the whole thing happen for us. Yeah. And the rest of the team. Yeah. And uh, yeah, beers, a bit. high fives. Yeah. <laughs> and then we uh, we actually stayed then to help them kind of decamp. And yeah. I mean, some people fly out from base camp. Uh, and down the valley and they'll fly back to Kathmandu. Some will even, you know, there's been issues on Everest in the past where people have made fraudulent kind of insurance claims to fly from Camp 2, right. claiming that they've got issues when they haven't. You know, yeah. There's a documentary on that a few years ago really? and that goes on. Yeah. Whereas we kind of helped decamp the camp and then yeah. we all walked down the valley together back to Lukla, which yeah. was cool. Nice. And, then, uh, and it was nice actually just walking. I mean, that valley is phenomenal. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it was the first time I'd walked down there really being able to enjoy without thinking about a job that I've got to do at the other end of this yeah, this yeah. journey with yeah. the previous trips up there I'd had things I'm to plan. I'm hoping to do a track to base camp one day because I heard it I heard it's not too difficult if you're just going for Well it's not difficult at all yeah, it's, it's just, just it's, you're just trekking like a, it's a, it's a, there's no climbing involved yeah. whatsoever it's it's a I mean there's it, obviously you're going to feel the atmospheric pressure change yeah. from 3100 to 5300 and you get you might you know you get the odd headache, headache and some people get extracted because they yeah. some people's bodies just don't allow them to to acclimatize unfortunately and yeah. that might happen but the majority of people will feel uncomfortable at some yeah. point but it's not you know it's not an arduous experience yeah. 
So I'd totally recommend it, but yeah. do your due diligence on yeah. where you're staying, who you're going with, because there's a lot of companies that don't respect the environment. Yeah, you know, yeah. they, they, they litter, you know, their health is mm-hmm. an issue. DMV mm. is rife in some of these areas because yeah. hygiene is not, yeah. hygiene standards aren't very high yeah. in some places and they're yeah. not, yeah. You know, whereas others are all over it and yeah. they've got great reputations. Yeah. So look into who you're going to go and I'll yeah. say if, you, if you're interested, I'll tell you who to go with. Yeah. <laughs> so what's next? Uh, so now I'm in the process of uh, trying to prepare an expedition um, to the South Pole. So I want to- To the South Pole? Yeah, walk to the South Pole unsupported, unassisted. Um, so I'm hoping if I can get the funding in place that me and a guide, a guy that I'm going to work with on it, are going to walk on support and assisted from the continental edge, one of the routes called from Hercules Inlet yeah. to the South Pole. So that'll be over a thousand kilometers on support and assisted. Um, and then when we get to the South Pole, we then go do a quick change, then go and climb the highest mountain in Antarctica called Vincent, Mount Vincent, Vincent Massive. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping if I get the funding in to be able to get a team of injured guys on Vincent with us. Um, so I've just started the plans for that. Um, and when are, you, when are you hoping to do that? Next winter. Yeah, so November, we're hoping to depart November uh, 2021. That'll be summer down there, won't yeah, it? Yeah, we'll, we'll just the end of their winter coming into their spring. Right. So we want to start as early as we can to maximize our chances of getting there within the time frame. Because um, we've got to, we're gonna to have to hit a certain distance a day on that one because the last flight to get to the base of Vincent's to climb it leaves early January. Yeah. So we've got to, have to push the pace to get there in time to get that flight. So um, so training's already started. So we started dragging tires now and yeah. in the gym with the old squats going again yeah. and getting back in the hills with yeah. carrying kit and yeah, everything that kind of makes you Hopefully miserable. the gyms will be back open soon. Be able to but I'm very in. fortunate. We've got a, you know, I've got a squat system at home. So right. kind of beginning of the first lockdown, you know, training for me is essential. Yeah. If, if not, if not, you know, you, when you kind of, like I said before, there's controllable and uncontrollable risks. Yeah. Mother nature will always dictate whether or not you're successful on these things. Yeah, but yeah. you, you cannot, from a responsibility perspective, you cannot go into these environments yeah. with a team that's not prepared. Yeah. And not being physically prepared, just, there's no excuse for that. Yeah. So we have to train Get um, to the standard thing. required. So yeah, yeah, we. So I invested in uh, in kit at home to yeah. train at the first lockdown. Well, that's good. So I've got a I've got a good team around me that help prepare us physically for what we're yeah. doing. So we know what we're doing, and uh, I've been doing this for a while now. So we've got yeah. a bit of experience. So we've got a good idea of the kind of pain and misery that's coming our way over the next nine months. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and and my, my ultimate goal is to hopefully become the first disabled person in history to climb the highest peak on every continent of the world, and to walk on us unsupported, unassisted to the North and South Poles. So I've just got the South Pole, Vincent, left to do now. Yeah. And a mountain in Australasia called Carson's Pyramid. Um, I've done the rest. And you've done the rest. Yeah. Wow. Well, good luck, Martin. Thank you so much for this. This has been incredibly insightful. No, it's been um, a bit different. Yeah. Um, We'll have to get you back when you get back from the South Pole. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll tell you how cold it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Compare how cold it was to the North Pole and Everest. Yeah. <laughs>